So this is Stephanie, I'm Daniel, and we are regenerative farmers. I think, I think it'd be probably good for us to start off with what we ate for breakfast, because we're, we're unlike, we're, we're, I guess we're, we're probably unlike 99% of farmers even, that we actually grow the majority of our own food versus just growing things to sell. Because most farmers that I know, they grow a product to sell into the market, and then they buy all of their all of their calories from the supermarket, just like everybody else. Like a lot of a lot of people that grew up in the suburbs or in the city assume that farmers, quote unquote farmers, that have all these corn and soybeans and on these thousands of acres of, of crops, that they're actually eating those crops, but they're not. Like the average farmer around around us is running hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of acres, and there's not one calorie of food that they actually can consume. So that's that's makes us fairly unique. Um, so what did I have? I had mashed potatoes from potatoes that that I planted and spent a lot of time trying to eradicate the potato beetles that were an infestation plague this year. Um, there was lard from our pigs. There was eggs from our chickens. There was sauerkraut from cabbage that Stephanie grew in the garden and I made fermented. and fermented. Uh, what else? That's about it. That's about all I had. That's, that's what we had for breakfast. And we're drinking not coffee, but tea, herbal tea that uh, we wild forage a lot of herbs and food, but I also grow a fair amount of them in my garden, uh, very specific medicinal or herbal teas. And I dry them probably 25 gallons worth of dried uh, herbs for tea, for food, for medicine making. And that's what we enjoy. Uh, we partake in drinking of these teas and medicines, but we also uh, use a fair amount of what we harvest for our animals, for holistic management, for preventative care. So I was born on this farm. I grew up on this farm. When I was 18 years old, I had I had to decide: Do I go to college? Do I do I get you know? I was I was actually I finished high school early, so they they sent me the the state allowed me to go to a technical school for welding for free. So I was finishing up my welding degree when I was 18, and all my other friends were going to college. So I'm like, well, that's what I want to do. And I went. For five years, I I because I worked my way through it. So there I took a couple semesters off and I worked so I didn't have any debt at the end of it. And I didn't know what that I wanted to do. So I ended up studying. Actually, I wanted to study biology or, or ecology. And I, I couldn't I couldn't take that as a major because I could not pass remedial algebra. My brain does not work with 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 algebra or any other intangible things. So I ended up taking what I could take without algebra, which was business and economics, which is so funny that I could do that without algebra. So I, I studied business and economics, and I could see by studying that how screwed up our economic system is. And I learned enough about that that I knew that I didn't really want to be part of it. Um, moved to Colorado for a couple of years, did a lot of snowboarding and skiing, bought and sold classic cars as a living. And then 9-11 happened, which probably none of you were alive at that time. Holy cow. Um, and I just watched how America fell into more fear than they already were in as a culture. And I just didn't want to be part of it. So I, I decided to leave. And I ended up going to a country that at least I knew somebody and I speak the language. Uh, I went to Australia. So I was in Australia for a dozen years. And in that time, I learned more about our, our plight as a species and all of, you know, climate change and, and resource depletion and desertification, all, the, all of these problems that we're facing by our own hands. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta change everything, everything. 
And so I ended up quitting the job that I had, which was working for the state of Tasmania as the, as the um, I was the auditor and prosecutor for chemical spraying operations of the state. So I got to see the seedy underbelly of industrial agriculture in Tasmania for, for a number of years. But I quit my job and I became a full-time environmental activist. So I was going to all the protests, just like y'all were mentioning earlier. Um, I was, I, I would don my suit and I would go in and I would talk to the advisors for the minister of Tasmania and talk about energy policy reform. And I learned all I could about energy. Uh, I learned all I could about climate change. And I just ate, slept, and pooped this stuff. And that's all I did. And like David said, I'm kind of intense. And so when I get into something, I get into it. And so that's that's what I did. And I was a vegetarian for seven years. During this period, I lived in a boat for a couple of years in Hobart. Vegan. Uh, I was a freegan for for a couple of years where I only ate food that was thrown out. I just, I would not eat anything that was, because the moment you pay for something, you're creating a demand for that product to be brought to the market. And so I just like, I didn't want to be part of that even. So I ended up getting to know all of the restaurateurs and Hobarts and all of the market stall holders um, at the farmer's market. And at the end of the day, I would go in there and say, hey, you know, and they all knew me. Oh, yeah, you're, you're Daniel. You're the environmental activist. And I like what you're doing. Here's some food that we're going to throw away anyway. And so I lived like that for a long time. And then I just realized that, you know, there was, there was, you know, after traveling to 37, 38 countries in the world and seeing firsthand the destruction that our culture is reaping on the planet, um, I realized that the only way to try and, and fix this was to go back to where I was from and work at creating a different culture, um, trying to steer the culture from where it's going. And I think we can all agree that where it's going is not a good place. So I came back here in 2011. Um, Ended up in California working for a group called the Sustainability Roadshow, uh, which we went to music festivals and colleges and talked about sustainability. Uh, to be quite honest with you, at this stage, the word sustainability makes me want to vomit in my mouth because we are so far down the road towards ecological and and. Uh, you know, biosphere collapse, the, the, the concept of sustaining what we have is laughable. Like there is no, there is no sustainable at this point. There's only regenerative or bust. Um, but I, I jumped ship off of that biodiesel powered bus that was going around America when I heard about Occupy Wall Street. And I ended up living in a park with a whole bunch of other activists for a month and a half at Zuccotti Park in in downtown Manhattan, um, realizing then and there that that was like the best and smartest and most dedicated activists that America had to offer. And yet they were completely reliant on the system that they railed against. And this is my biggest problem with, with activism is that most, like 99.9% .9 of activists that I know, they they're trying to kill the system with one hand while they're feeding it with the other because they are completely reliant on that system for their life. And so how, how well are we going to fight that system when unconsciously we know that without that system, we will die. We're not going to fight it that hard and we're not. Um, so that's why I decided to come back here. I'm like, you know what, this farm, this, this fertility, this soil, this, this, this bioregion can support an amazing amount of diversity, an amazing amount of life. There's fertility here that's just unheard of a lot of places in the world. And I realized that I wanted to come back here where there hardly was any community. There was hardly any activists because it seems like rural America, really not many people care about much. But I wanted to come back here and, and create something and show people what is possible. And luckily I met Stephanie down in North Carolina living on an intentional community and she was doing this stuff as well. And so you can tell them your quick story. I 
went to college, graphic design degree, had a corporate job after college. Realized five years into it, uh, my success didn't really feel good. I wasn't happy with my life, even though everyone told me how successful I was and my family was so proud of me. Long story short, I traded it all in and went out onto the road to the unknown, ended up in an intentional community on a farm where I spent two years bouncing around to different farms and other people's gardens and learning how to grow food, how to manage animals. And that was when I discovered I'm a land-based being. This is where my joy and my happiness and my talents really shine. And I knew from that moment on, I wanted to seek a life um, in community, growing food. And I meet Daniel, I come up here to his farm and I realized all of the work that I was doing down south to grow just a bit of food uh, was a lot harder than it needed to be. There was no soil down there. The soil in Minnesota was foreign to me. I had never seen such a, a rich deposit of topsoil. And then I realized my dreams of being sustainable and not having to buy much at all uh, could be realized here. And even though down south it was beautiful and the community was wonderful and I had lots of beloved friends who were like family, I could never realize my dream of living a sustainable life down there because there was no topsoil, because where the community was happened to be in a region that people just never should have settled, where hooven animals should never live. And I never realized that until I could see a totally different ecology where food and hooven animals actually belong. So that is why I made the hard decision to leave my community, to leave my Southern roots and culture, uh, to come up here where things are very different. I traded community for sustainable life and we grow the majority of our food, you know, upwards of 90% of our food is grown here. And medicine. And medicine. All right. You all ready for food systems? Um, I want to make mention that my ancestors that came here and, and basically stole this land, they stole it from the Metawakanton Sioux people. And that, that was the tribe, that was the people that were here on this land for thousands of years until my white ancestors came along and did their thing. Um, and I think, and I want to touch, I want to touch on this at the end of our talk, but I want to touch on this now as well, is that the difference between the agricultural model for indigenous people, and, and make no mistake, they, they did have agriculture. They weren't just hunter-gatherers. A lot of our, of our colonial um, narrative is that the indigenous people were just hunter-gatherers, which in, in, in the narrative of our ancestors is like, well, that's inferior, even if they were just hunter-gatherers, just hunter-gatherers but they also had an agricultural model. Did it look like this? Absolutely not. And I was thinking about it this morning. What is the main difference between the indigenous agricultural model of other, you know, all over the world um, and the colonial and, and um, industrial agricultural model that we're now mostly eating from and the, the biggest difference is that there was, there is no connection with the industrial model. Like even, even the few students that mentioned about where their, where their food came from this morning. And I, I appreciate the fact that they knew as much as they did, but I noticed that almost everyone that talked about it, even you, David, you mentioned, you, you went back as far as where it was bought or where it was packaged but not as far back as where it was grown. And that disconnection between the consumer and the producer of these of, of food is in large part where this whole system has gone off the rails because at one point a hundred years ago, there was like 80% of Americans lived and worked on farms. And today in 2021, it's less than 1% 
of Americans live or work on farms. And so now you've got this very, very, very small group growing the food for everybody else. And all these people living in the cities and the suburbs that have never actually grown anything themselves or never really even travel out to the rural America to see where it's grown. And even if they do, they just see vast fields. They don't really even know what it is. They just, it's, it's so, it's so foreign to them that they, there's, there's really no chance for any reverence or any connection between them and what they're eating. And that in turns creates the parameters for a system to do whatever it takes for the consumer to get what they want, which a, a disconnected consumer wants two things mostly. They want cheap and they want convenient. And if that's all we really care about, then that's what these farmers are going to give us. And they'll do whatever it takes to give us more of that cheap and convenience. And we've been doing that now as an agricultural model for generations. And the result is, is atrocious. And you all, I'm sure, have learned about that. I'm not going to go into the, the horrors of industrial agriculture. Like, I'll talk about veganism quickly, though, because a lot of, a lot of younger people are becoming vegans because they, they know enough about the horrors of industrial agriculture, especially the horrors of industrial animal agriculture to know that they don't want to be part of it. And, I, and I'm actually grateful to them that they care enough to not want to feed that system by giving them money and saying, this is more, we want more of this, please. We want more of, you know, 10,000 pigs in a barn. We want more of cattle standing in their own shit in the feedlot. Um, I, I give them kudos for actually caring enough to want to do something. But the thing is, is that that veganism relies on that disconnection because it's like you're you're close those those people that are choosing that vegan diet are close to, to breaking through and doing something you know better than what they're doing right now by by eschewing the animal agriculture system we're we're basically saying i don't want to take part in it you're so you're saying i i, I don't want the bad but you're not actually figuring out what the good is. And we're gonna talk more about that when we take you on our tour about the difference between perennial agriculture and annual agriculture. And the difference between um, like a, a, a closed loop system and a linear system. And yes. I like that you, you brought up the Metawakatan and the, that they had agriculture. Yes. They weren't just hunter gatherers. I'd like to just quickly um, explain what that, look like. So our region is where the tall grass prairie met the big woods. It's called an edge. An edge is a highly diversified ecology because you've got two ecologies meeting here and in that middle. Overlap. They overlap and it becomes even more diversified than a rainforest. They manage this land to be open and to have prairies. This was, was not completely natural and they managed it through burning. They would burn big swaths of prairie and that would keep little baby tree seedlings that are about this big from growing into big trees and the forest from taking over the prairie. And the reason they did this is because their main staple, they ate bison. Bison evolved in this ecology here where we live in central Minnesota. The bison would smell the burning prairie from hundreds of miles away and they would change their route and follow that smell because they knew when they got to that prairie, all of the juicy young grasses will be coming up and all the, the old mature woody stuff would have been burnt away. So basically it's like candy for bison and they would about face to go seek out the candy, even though they know uh, when they would get there, they would be hunted. Now they wouldn't be hunted into extinction. The Metawakatan would take what they needed to um, feed their tribe, and, and that would be it. So the bison would come in by the thousands, and they would chomp down this beautiful new growth. They would poop and pee, and they would stomp in all this fertility into the prairie, and they would move on. They maybe wouldn't come back for months, maybe not even years. So this land got hit hard. It got burnt 
and then it got uh, chomped and pooped and peed on and it got roughed up, but then it got to rest. And through that rest, it would take in all of this fertility and it would regenerate, it would grow stronger, it would grow bigger, it would create more life in the soil microbiome because of all the fertility from the bison. So it was kind of this beautiful symbiosis of rest and disturbance of birth and death. Uh, but this land was very much managed to be this tall grass prairie. Well, in Oak Savannah. So there was, there was a strip between the big woods and the prairie where the, the Native Americans actually actively managed this to be in Oak Savannah. And if you look throughout the world, there is, there is evidence of savannas being managed by the indigenous people all over the world. And the irony is, is that all of the, the city parks that you've ever visited in your life, in any city that you ever care to go to, anywhere in the world, they are mimicking that oak savanna because humans evolved in this oak savanna. We, 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 this is our like home, is to have trees spread out, not, not canopy trees, not a forest, but trees spread out and grass underneath. And because like, like you said, we, they ended up hunting these bison and deer and, and other animals, but also they utilized the acorns and other, and other nut trees that were producing nuts as their carbohydrate source. Instead of us like using wheat, they used nuts. You know, a lot of us, most of us, I'm, I'd say, I'd say 100% of the people in this class are, are, are understanding of climate change and their understanding of the, of the situation that we're finding ourselves in. And, you know, the, the main narrative of, unfortunately, there is this divide. It seems like rural America, because they're they're different in politics. They're just like, oh, climate change doesn't exist. And all the people that live in the cities are like, oh my God, climate change is gonna kill us all. Um, which I believe that climate change is going to kill us all if we don't do something about it. Um, but we talk about the emissions from agricultural systems being a, a humongous part of the carbon emissions that we have to face. And I, I don't know, the last time I saw it, it was probably like 25% of, of, of all greenhouse emissions are coming from our agricultural system. Um, and so there is this narrative of we just, if we just eat less meat, then there'll be less carbon emissions. And a lot of this, a lot of the facts and figures that you see on if you eat less meat, then there's a dis decrease in all these emissions and all these bad things you got to remember that that those figures are coming from worst case scenario if all of the cows in the world are raised on a feedlot being fed force-fed corn and other grains that they were never meant to eat then yeah then yeah that that actually is true but it's not that clear cut there there is no simple answers in this and the fact remains that there's a lot of other people that are using animals like us to draw down carbon. Like the, the, the way that we are sequestering carbon through regenerative agriculture, and maybe I should give a quick synopsis on what regenerative agriculture is, is we're using livestock, ruminant animals, and ruminant animals are a, like a, a four stomached animal that can actually break down the cellulose in grasses. We cannot, other animals cannot, ruminant animals can. And so we're using, the best proxy that we can to the bison that evolved in this ecology as cows. Cows are far smaller, they're more docile, They've, we've, we've bred them over thousands of years to be really good at eating grass and, and really easy to manage. And they give us meat and milk and, and, and leather and other products. Um, but so here's, here's the really quick and dirty of it is, if, if there's a prairie grass that is say eight feet tall above ground, the root system is 15 to 20 feet deep. Now, if there is like, like a cool season grass, which is, a, which is more of a, a European introduced species of grass, 
um, you know, those will get three feet, four feet above ground and their root system is six to seven feet deep. But either way, when an animal comes along and they eat, say like 70% of that grass plant, that root system has a whole bunch of stored carbohydrates and that those carbohydrates were produced by photosynth photosynthesis when the grass plant was you know in full mature state and it stores these these carbohydrates in the root system for that time when there is the disturbance of the bison or the cow coming along and chomp 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 and then those those carbohydrates flood out of that root system and the root system actually dies back it sloughs off and so that say six feet of root system now goes back down to being only two feet deep while it's repowering the leaves to then start capturing this the sun energy again and, and enabling it to store that carbohydrate energy and regrow that root system it's the it's the regrowth and dying off of that root system over and over and over in that disturbance and rest ecological cycle that is sequestering carbon. That is what created the topsoil in the Midwest. That is, it is the most fertile topsoil, some of the most fertile topsoil the world's ever known is here. Um, the, the average soil organic matter in this region before white people came along until the top, until the, the prairies uh, was 12 to 15% soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is an, another word for carbon. So that was, it was just black soil. And that was all carbon from 10,000 years, you know, of, of that process, just, just sequestering carbon year after year after year, putting it in the soil. And that, that carbon molecule that is entangled in that soil is like a sponge for minerals, nutrients, and water. So the, the capacity for that soil to, to, absorb and hold water is is like a magnitude more than than the soil that doesn't have as much so so it's it's like a win 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 all the way around like we we have to recognize that there's like i'm, I'm sure you've studied this but it's a it's a good reminder of like long-term carbon cycles and short-term carbon cycles very different when we're when we're burning carbon that was sequestered millions of years ago in the form of fossils fossil fuel, um, we are releasing carbon that hasn't been in this system for millions of years. And that's what's really messing us up. But also, like if you extrapolate the fact that, you know, on this farm, it would have been 12 to 15 percent organic matter 150 years ago. And now the average around on this farm, you know, on our farm, it's like four to five percent on our neighbor's farms. It's less than two. You extrapolate that over the 100 million acres of farmland in America right now, and you're talking seriously huge numbers that is all coming down to our food choices. When we're choosing cheap and convenient through annual agriculture, where they're tilling and replanting every single year, every time you till the soil with a plow or chisel plow, field cultivator, whatever, that is oxidizing that carbon to the atmosphere and we're losing that carbon to the atmosphere. And what kind of crops are you talking about that they might be able to say, oh, this, I eat this. Corn and soybeans are the big two. Like that is the biggest commodity crop in this industrial system. And that requires to be tilled every year to be planted. What else did they actually eat? Uh, so, so the corn and soy, you, uh, you're probably not going out and eating that, but it's in foods that you may eat. It's in all kinds of processed food, oh, even in play in things that you would never think that it would be, it, it's there. But the other things, oats are grown this way. Wheat is grown this way. Uh, but cows are not grown this way. We don't till the soil. We don't need to because cows eat. The natural forage that grows there in in our system in our system in but in regenerative in general yes which this system is scalable there are people doing it on a massive um scale so it's not a consequence of just a small farm thing it can be done on a large scale and it can feed lots of people
But the reason it, it doesn't right now is because the people don't choose it. They, uh, we've had vegans come here to live with us for two months. And I asked the first day, what do you have for breakfast? I want to cater to you because I want you to feel comfortable here. He said he ate, ate granola. Well, great. I, I can make granola. I have oats. We don't grow oats here, but we buy a big, two big bags of oats a year. It amounts to 50 pounds of oats that are grown here in Minnesota. Um, and it is annual agriculture. So they till the soil to grow these oats. Um, and we don't try to eat them very often because we don't want to vote for that reality of tilling the soil all the time. So we eat you know, a, a smaller amount than probably most. So great, I can make him some granola. Do you just eat granola? What do you have with that granola? Oat milk, he said. Well, we had just learned about oat, oat milk because Vice News came here that spring and told us how they did an expose. Oat milk just has exploded on the market and people are going crazy for it. And these oats are not grown in America. They are contracting folks in South America to grow oats because they're willing to grow it really cheaply. And they found, once they started digging and following the trail, they were clear cutting rainforests. They were clear cutting virgin rainforests to make more land available that they could till and grow oats because it's become lucrative in South America now to grow oats for this company called Oatly because oat milk is a fad. So the consumers are driving this. They can also, they can change it. They can steer this in a whole new direction, but sometimes it's not so much what you do, it's what you choose not to do, which has all the power. All right, so we're just out in one of our pastures. We subdivide all of our pastures into smaller paddocks, and so we can mimic that that disturbance and rest cycle a lot more intensively. So I just got done working for three weeks, putting in interior fencing. So now we have eight separate paddocks that we can open a gate, move the cows, and in that in those paddocks, I can use step-in posts with movable fencing. And so we can end up having like say 32 paddocks. And so they get every time, they, the whole idea is, is that we never, we never graze the plants down to the ground. We only graze say like 75% of them. So we also have all of our wetlands that were originally here. This, this region in Minnesota was called the Prairie Pothole region at one point. We had you know, a lot of people know Minnesota is a land of 10,000 lakes, but we're also, we had hundreds of thousands of wetlands before white people came along. So this is, this is a good example of cool season grass pasture. So there's clovers and alfalfa and multiple species of grasses. So this is some of the last forage left for the season. And this, is a tall grass prairie. So we actually had this replanted into a native tall grass prairie about nine years ago. And we did cut some hay off of this this year because it was a drought year and we needed some hay for the winter because man, we hardly got any rain. And this is one of the things that I, I like to explain to people, the, the ramifications, the ecological ramifications about what we choose to eat. If we choose cheap and convenient from annual agriculture, all these prairies are gone. Um, this is a perennial system that needs to be, you know, it just never needs, never, never can be tilled. Otherwise it's gone. Um, but like wetlands, 98% of our wetlands in the Midwest have been drained for making more cropland. Um, and that has huge ramifications on our hydrological system. Like the wetlands are, they're like our, our batteries for our aquifers. They slowly, they, they take in huge amounts of water in rain events and they slowly recharge our aquifers. And when those wetlands are gone, then that water moves across the landscape that much faster and, and heads towards into the rivers and the rivers flood and it just 
takes a whole bunch of topsoil with it. But this is what this land naturally looks like. We can't eat any of this stuff, but the cows can. So we utilize this land for what it wants to be naturally. And we grow food as a byproduct to ecological restoration. So we're restoring this the way it wanted to be before white man, the way it was before white man. And we're using the cattle to mimic that and to encourage this uh, restoration. I want to just make mention really quickly, like a lot of people don't know this, but cows, I've watched my cows eat around snakes. I've watched my cows like literally eat around ducks nests when, when ducks are nesting in this ecology. Um, so cows are part of the system and they, they, they're like, they're in balance with it. So now we're in the neighbor's field. Let's get down in there. Can y'all see that? Yes, we can. What do you see, people? Soybeans. Soybeans. This is monoculture, bare soil. You can't even see an ant in here. And look at it, one texture, one color. And look at our farm, no bare soil, lots of textures, lots of different colors. Lots of diversity. Strong diversity. So this is the greatest power you have as a consumer to choose not to buy this, not to buy products that have this in it. But yeah, like this, this is, this is a really visceral on like learning um, for people that are here on the land to see that stark difference between that perennial system in this annual system i don't know if it actually comes through on the computer or not but it's it's one of the main things that we like to share with people because you're right we everybody wants to know what they can do personally what you know once they recognize how screwed up our food system is they all want to know what what power do they have in that system what is their what is their point of intervention what is their greatest leverage point and on, you know, some people, I mean, heck, there's, there's any one of you can decide, hey, I want, I want to live this way. I, I want to be a regenerative farmer. You know, if there's, there's a whole bunch of barriers. We can go into that later. But if you, if somebody wants to, they can. Like there's, our farm is always looking for people that want to live this way on our farm. Every other regenerative farmer is just crying out for human labor. That is the main bottleneck for this system to succeed is just human labor because that's, that's why the industrial system is getting more and more automated because it, it creates the conditions for more cheap and more convenient. And when you're going the opposite direction, you need more labor. So for some people they can do that for the other people that are going to continue living in the suburbs or in the urban areas the best thing that they can be doing is being informed consumers and they make different decisions with their with their buying power so if if you're saying if you're if you're saying that the only place you're willing to shop is that supermarket then you're you're your choices are going to be pretty limited. Um, boy, like, and this is, this, this spins off into all kinds of other questions about um, social inequities, economic inequities, like food deserts in, in urban areas, those kind of things. But for a lot of us, we have farmer's markets. That's probably your best outlet as to where to find people that are doing something different. And a lot of times, you know, even then the pickings are going to be slim, but if you start doing some, some research, some Googling on regenerative farms in your area, you're going to find some. And 
you know, whether those are, whether they have an outlet at the farmer's market or whether you have to reach out to them um, direct from their farm, those are the things you can do. Like, it's like, and this is the thing is like, as more and more people do that, then the choices get more and more. It's like the whole system is tipped so far to one way that it's going to take pioneers to bring it back. Okay, so here's some practical advice. You, you go into the grocery store, don't buy boxes and cans. Go for whole foods, okay? You go to the uh, produce. They'll tell you where the produce is coming from. Choose the local stuff over the California stuff. And when it's January and you want a tomato, don't buy it. <laughs> Just don't buy it. You know, you, sorry, no tomatoes in January because they're going to come from California. They're going to come from uh, uh, the industrial system sometimes it's what you choose not to buy yeah like bananas and avocados and things like you just understanding where all this stuff comes from and then saying i'm choosing not to get those things i'll tell you i love bananas and then realize hey bananas don't grow anywhere within like two thousand miles of where i live three thousand miles of where i live i'm not gonna eat bananas anymore and so i just never eat bananas anymore avocados same thing like i love avocados I would never buy an avocado. Um, and a lot of a lot of a lot what allows us to eat 90% of our own calories in this farm is that we we eat a very simple diet. We we eat a lot of the way that our ancestors ate. We don't eat things out of season. I don't eat strawberries from a supermarket. I would rather go 50 weeks of the year without eating a strawberry because the the one time that I eat those strawberries fresh off of the bush it's like, it's, it's like heaven. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'd say about that. You know, and I, I had the same thing. We've, we've all been on this journey. I was brought up in the same system you guys were brought up in. I was a complete clueless consumer. My parents fed me nothing but boxes and cans and fast food. And so I was, I was totally clueless at, at one point I was the same point as you Clayton. I was like, well, how do I make better decisions at the supermarket? And then pretty soon there was only a few things that I could buy at the supermarket. So then I started, I started, I found food co-ops and you'll find, that's another good idea is like find a, find a food co-op. There's, there's some around you guaranteed. And then I started shopping the food co-op exclusively. But then as my, as my interest in this and my awareness in this grew more and more, there became a time where I hardly could find anything that I wanted at the food co-op. And so it, I just kept going further and further down this rabbit hole, but it's all, it all starts with something. So we're a regenerative farm, uh, which means we work with the ecology to grow food. We grow food as a byproduct to ecological restoration. And one of the ways that we increase uh, the productivity here on the farm is by utilizing a waste stream. We get these barrels three times a week from the local grocery store. And this is food that is still good, but it's been taken out of the human supply chain for whatever reason, too much or it has a bruise on it. But a lot of it comes in these bags. And, and it's increasing in frequency on how often things are coming wrapped in plastic and in bags. And before we intervene, this food was all going to the landfill. And it varies by season, it varies uh, week from week, but... Yay! Pretty cool. 
nipples that gives them fresh water whenever they like. They just slightly bite down this valve and the water comes out. So this is, this is the dirty little secret of sustainable agriculture is that it's not sustainable. Oh, yeah. Like the all of the other agriculture is not sustainable in so many other ways. They externalize the costs on the land and on the water and on the workers and on everything. Sustainable farmers generally internalize the cost. And so they do it by, by working for five dollars an hour or less. Yeah, much. But it but it would be literally probably like five times what you would pay at the supermarket. And there's only so much the market will bear before people are like, no. Even people that are like super duper lefty liberal do-gooders in the city are like, I really want to support these farms. They'll only go so far because in their mind, their real their expectations of what food should cost was caused by conventional agriculture and so yeah we've we've just done the numbers like no matter what we do if we do it well if we do it ecologically well in a, in a really good fashion for the animals and the land there's just no way that we can even if we charge the most that we can but for the consumers we're still making so little money that it's better I'm, I'm actually happier just to give it away and work doing what I'm doing which is fixing shiny things because that's what people value Yes, but what this is a big topic is how do we get young people onto farms because the average age of farmers in this country is 62 growing up and the, 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 the barriers to entry for young people are humongous like land prices are ridiculously high and there's so little money to be made that even if you could get on land how do you make the mortgage payment and that's that always comes down to consumers like I don't know how to get consumers to want to spend more be okay with spending more and have less shiny gadgets and spend more on food. I don't know how that works yet. Have you had this property in your family? How did you? I grew up here, oh. I, and I had the extreme privilege of inheriting it. But and we're trying to leverage that privilege by buying more land adjacent to it, so we can get other young people and like, hey, let's teach you how to do this. Let's get you out doing your own thing. But there's also this extreme lack of other young people that are interested in doing this lifestyle because they, they know that there is like, okay, if I'm a privileged white person and I can go to college and get a good job and make a lot of money and buy shiny things like all my peers are doing, what's the incentive to then instead go over here and go into huge amounts of debt and learn all kinds of new skills and, and be way out of my comfort zone and be permanently in poverty? It's, it's a hard ask. toxicity problems in pastures is when people set stock. And when set, set stocking is when you have a perimeter fence, you let the animals in the set, good luck to you. And they never move. They're just stuck in that one spot forever. And so it, no, so they're not moved. And so they, they run out of everything they like first. And then they're like, well, shit, I got to survive. And so they're eating anything. And they'll, they'll eat whatever it takes, even toxic stuff. And then they'll die. <laughs> But there's all kinds of bad things that come with set stocking. My parents set stocked for 50 years, and they just didn't know any better. I didn't know any better until I went out in the world like, oh, this is bad. And over time, what happens is that every time one of their favorites sticks their head above the ground, they bite it off, and, it, and it, so it's like, okay, every every time it's like, I'm gonna try, oh, I'm gonna go. Oh. And so over time, those all die, and all you end up with are all the things that they don't want. And, and also, the way that we sequester carbon through grazing is that cows evolve with grasses. They're, they're an herbivore, so they... They're ruminant animals. They have four stomachs. So they can break down cellulose and grasses. So if a grass plant is like three feet above ground, their root system is going down like five or six feet. And every time they eat a grass plant that's three feet, deep, three feet tall down to, say, a foot, the root system has to die back 
to give it, that plant the ability to go back into photosynthetic stage. So it's like, it's, it's a rechargeable battery. The root system sequesters um, sugars in starch, carbohydrates, and then when the plant calls on it, it gives that plant those starches to come back to life. But every time those roots die back, it sequesters carbon. It puts, it, it, it puts uh, organic matter back in the soil. And so it's that cycling of, of like eating and resting and regrowing just over and over and over again that built this topsoil over 10,000 years since the last ice age into three feet of ridiculously fertile topsoil. Like that's, that's why we have the topsoil we have in the Midwest. So you move these periodically? So we move these... Every week or... Every like at this time of year, this is not a good time of year to see it because all the grasses have gone dormant. They're already like, I'm out for the year. So at this stage, and I'm out for the year, I'm so tired. I am so tired, people. <laughs> I just want a break and so I'm just at this stage I'm just saying good luck to you I'm set stocking you for the next whatever so I'm already feeding them hay in the feed bunk we got them water but they're just out here eating what's left of these grass plants before they die because all, everything you see above ground at this point it's just it's there for the taking the roots have already stored everything they need to store for the winter so if they don't eat it it's all gonna die anyway and just how do you know when they need more nutrition and what they're going to get? They'll tell you. Oh, they'll tell you. <laughs>